Do any of these look familiar? They're sure not the familiar sight they were once in service departments. All of these, the old style batteries, the filler jugs that metered distilled water, the hydrometers for measuring battery acid, all have been made obsolete by the new so-called maintenance-free batteries. It's for sure that maintenance-free batteries have eliminated the need to constantly monitor and replenish battery water. But does that make them truly worthy of their name? Are they really maintenance-free? Well, the fact is, Delco Freedom batteries do require some routine maintenance. Maintenance that many service technicians overlook simply because they think the Freedom in Freedom battery delivers them from any kind of service attention. But that's not the case. Remember, it's still a battery. Like other batteries, the Freedom battery can become discharged. And like other batteries, it can need testing and charging. I'm here to talk with you about testing the Freedom battery, about charging a battery that's become discharged, and about some of the ways that batteries become discharged. For starters, let's look at some of the major design features of a Freedom battery. For example, the polypropylene case has an internally ribbed design. It's exceptionally strong and durable. And because the case is translucent, you can look right through the case and see the electrolyte level makes it easy to determine if there's been a leak. This liquid gas separator in the cover traps escaping electrolyte and returns it to the electrolyte reservoir. And these two small vents let any extra gas escape during temperature extremes and charging. And special flame arresters in the vents help protect against the possibility of an exploding battery. Now this is about as far as you can safely tip the battery. Beyond that, the electrolyte works through the liquid gas separator and leaks out the vent. So be careful not to tilt it beyond 45 degrees when you're carrying and installing the battery. Now, here's a feature you've undoubtedly seen. It's a built-in temperature compensating hydrometer. Tells us at a glance when the battery is charged well enough for testing. With this, there's no need to use a regular hydrometer to measure specific gravity, then having to temperature correct it. The built-in hydrometer is highly accurate and always with the battery. Here's how it works. Inside is a green ball that's designed to float in electrolyte at about a 65% state of charge. When the ball floats, a green dot appears in the center of the hydrometer eye. The green dot means the battery is charged well enough for testing. A dark colored eye is an indication that the battery has a low state of charge. If the hydrometer eye shows a light yellow color or is clear, then the electrolyte level is too low and the battery must be replaced. Using the built-in hydrometer is one way to help diagnose a battery problem. There are lots of possible reasons for a discharged battery. Most often, it's a symptom of a problem somewhere else in the car. So talk to the customer. Find out what sort of problem he or she is having. Is it really a battery system malfunction? But don't rely on the customer's word alone. Experience the problem yourself so you can verify its exact nature. Then go ahead and check the battery. To perform a battery check, start your diagnosis with a visual inspection. Check over the battery carrier and hold down. Make sure the battery is level and properly secured. Are the battery cable terminals clean and free from any corrosion? Replace any cable with frayed or damaged insulation. And don't overlook the engine to body ground strap. It can lead to discharge problems too. If everything's okay, remove the battery and examine it closely. Is it in good condition? Are there any cracks or broken sections that might leak electrolyte? If you see any obvious damage, replace the battery. But be sure to find the cause of the damage and prevent it from happening again. If you see some small amounts of electrolyte leakage, especially around the vent holes, that doesn't mean the battery is bad. The leakage might result from overcharging or from overtipping of the battery. Now, look down into the battery's built-in hydrometer. Is the green dot visible? If so, 
it means that the battery is 65% or more charged and is ready for use or testing. If you can't see anything green, tap the battery a couple of times to make sure the green ball isn't stuck out of sight. If the eye remains dark, the battery is below 65% charged, you have to charge it before you can run a load test. If the eye is clear or light yellow, the fluid level is below the bottom of the hydrometer. This might be the result of excessive or prolonged charging, a cracked or broken case, excessive tipping, or normal battery wear out. If the eye is clear or light yellow, replace the battery. Don't charge, test, or jump start it. Be careful, you can sometimes mistake a dark reading for a clear or light yellow. This is because of the light filtering through the translucent case. If you're not sure, gently shake the battery to determine the fluid level. Then shield the battery's sides from direct light so that you can get the true reading before you decide whether to replace the battery. The battery we're testing shows a green dot, so the next diagnostic step is to load test the battery. If the hydrometer eye was dark, the battery would have to be charged before any testing could be done. But this one is green, and that means we can go right ahead and run a load test. The tester we're using is a carbon pile type load tester. It's a voltmeter, an ammeter, and a carbon pile all in one unit. Begin your test by hooking the tester across the battery terminals. You'll want to use the Delco ST1201 adapters for the terminals. The first thing we're going to do is use the carbon pile load tester to remove the surface charge on the battery plates so we can get an accurate reading. Applying a 300 ampere load for 15 seconds will remove the surface charge from the battery. Surface charge is caused by the accumulation of hydrogen and oxygen bubbles on negative and positive plates respectively. It happens whenever the battery is charged, either with a charger or the generator when the vehicle is driven. It's temporary, but it can affect the testing results. By the way, another method of removing surface charge is to turn on the high beam headlights for four to five minutes. Then let the battery recover for about 15 seconds before proceeding. After the battery has recovered, it's ready for the actual test. The test specifications are located on the battery label. When you find out the specified test load for the battery you're testing, apply the load for 15 seconds. Look at the voltage after 15 seconds while the battery is under load. Then remove the load. If the voltage is 9.6 or above, and the battery temperature is above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, then the battery is good. You must look somewhere else for the discharging problem. If the battery doesn't quite test at 9.6 volts, check the electrolyte temperature before you decide the battery is no good. Battery temperature will change the minimum voltage needed to pass the load test. Determine the minimum voltage by estimating the temperature to which the battery has been exposed the last several hours. You do this by feeling the side of the battery. And do your best to estimate the temperature. This requires a certain knack that can only be acquired through experience. Electrolyte temperature rises very slowly, so it could take six to eight hours for a battery that's been outside for a while to warm up to room temperature. Then, if the voltage is equal to or above the minimum voltage listed in your know-how reference manual, the battery is good and can now be returned to service. If voltage is less than minimum requirements, replace the battery. We've been talking about a battery that is good and can be returned to service. But what if we have a battery that doesn't show a green dot? If the hydrometer eye is dark, the battery must be charged before any load test can be performed. You may think charging a battery is simply a process of hooking up a couple of leads from the charger and throwing a switch. Not so. One of your first concerns when you start charging a battery is to figure out how much time the battery should be charged. The Freedom battery can be fast charged or slow charged using the same equipment you would use for conventional unsealed batteries. The type of battery charger you're using is an important factor in estimating the necessary charge time. Battery chargers vary in the amount of voltage and current they provide. The charger that can supply only 5 amperes will require a much longer period of charging than a charger that can supply 30 amperes or more. Another consideration when you're calculating the charging time is the ampere size of the battery. A completely discharged large heavy-duty battery requires more than twice the recharging time of a completely discharged small battery.
The same formula applies to the amount of battery is discharged. It can take twice as long to charge a completely discharged battery than a half-charged battery. The battery's temperature also affects the charging time. A longer time is needed to charge any battery at zero degrees than at 80 degrees. When a fast charger is connected to a cold battery, the current accepted by the battery will be very low at first. Then, in time, the battery will accept the higher rate as it warms. The reason is this. Let's say the battery is half charged. At 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that battery takes a charge rate of 50 amperes. But the same battery at zero degrees Fahrenheit may take less than five amperes. The lower the amperage, the slower the charging time. Yet another factor to consider when you're calculating charging time is whether the battery is fully discharged or not. If it is fully discharged, several hours on the charger may pass before the battery begins accepting the charge. To estimate this time delay, connect a voltmeter across the battery while it's connected to the charger. If the voltage is 16 volts or above, it could take four hours before the charge indicator shows any charge to the battery. If it's below 16 volts, eight to 16 hours may be needed to show a charge. Remember, this isn't the charging time. It's the time that will elapse before the battery will begin to accept the charge. We still have to figure out the correct charging time for the battery over and above that. To do this, we can use the battery's reserve capacity rating. The RC rating for various Freedom batteries are listed in the know-how reference manual. The RC rating is the amount of time a fully charged battery can operate the car without generator current. This is determined by discharging a fully charged battery, which is in 80 degrees Fahrenheit, with a 25 ampere current draw until its terminal voltage output drops to 10 and a half volts. The number of minutes the discharge takes is the RC rating. For an average passenger car, it's about 75 minutes. To estimate how long to leave the charger connected, divide the RC number by the average charge rate in amperes. In other words, an RC rating of 75 divided by 25 amperes will indicate three hours of charging time. To charge the same battery using an average charge rate of 10 amperes would take 75 divided by 10 or seven and a half hours charging time. Charge time is measured in ampere hours. For example, a 25 ampere charge rate delivered for three hours would give a total of 75 ampere hours. So the charge time measured in ampere hours is the same number as the RC rating for the battery. This is all well and good, except that the charging rate on many chargers is not constant for the whole length of the charge time. Some chargers are taper rate chargers. They start off at a high rate then taper off to a lower rate as the battery is charged. The charger may start at a little over 30 amps and then drop off to 10 amps after an hour. The average time for that hour would be 20 amps. Although you won't know this rate before you begin charging, it's important to keep in mind when using this type of charger because it'll take longer to charge the battery. That's why it's important to check the battery every half hour or so to check if the green dot is showing. Now we'll take a look at the actual charging procedure. When charging batteries equipped with side terminals, the first step is to install a terminal adapter kit. Snug the adapter against the lead pads to reduce the resistance between the adapter and the terminals. If the adapter kit isn't available, an alternative method is to use 3 8 inch bolts together with 3 8 inch nuts, both with standard threads. The bolts should be one and a half inches long or longer you'll find step-by-step -step installation instructions in the know-how reference manual. The important thing when you use the bolt method is to be sure the charger clamps are attached to the nuts which are in firm contact with the lead pads. Do not use bolts alone. The threads of the bolt do not make good electrical contact with the threads inside the battery. The increased resistance may prevent charger current from flowing freely to the battery and this could make it appear the battery is not accepting the charge. Now set the charger on the high setting. If the battery charger has settings for regular and low maintenance, use the regular setting. This provides the maximum charging amperes. Now observe the charging rate and battery temperature. As mentioned earlier, it's a good idea to check the battery every half hour while it's charging. Feel for temperature with your hands. 
it should be less than 125 degrees with no gassing. If the battery feels hot or is spewing electrolyte, turn off the charger or reduce the charge rate. When the green dot appears, then the battery is at at least 65% charged and ready for a load test. To eliminate the effect of stratification, it helps to slightly tip or gently shake the battery. Oh, stratification. Well, stratification happens this way. Sulfuric acid formed as the battery is charged is heavier than the weakened electrolyte and tends to sink to the bottom of the cell. Because the Freedom battery is designed to resist gassing, there's very little bubbling to create a mixing action. The result is the weak electrolyte sits on top in the area around the hydrometer and produces a false reading. Just a final note about chargers. Some feature polarity protection circuitry, which prevents charging unless the charger leads and the battery terminals match correctly. Sometimes a completely discharged battery doesn't have enough voltage to activate this circuitry, even though the leads are properly connected. That's because the polarity protection circuit usually stops charging when it can't sense at least eight volts. If this is the case, hook a good battery up in parallel with the battery to be charged. The current from the good battery closes the polarity protection device and permits charging. You might also get some help with this in the charger manufacturer's instruction about how to bypass or override the circuitry. Okay, now we've got the battery charged and reinstalled. But how do we know the battery won't be dead again in another few days? At this point, we don't for sure, because we haven't figured out what caused the battery to fail. Now, it's very important to find out why the battery is discharging. So let's see if we can do so. Roughly, the causes of battery failure fall into three major categories. Things that people do that can discharge the battery, mechanical problems with the vehicle that discharge the battery, and some things that can happen to the battery during vehicle shipping and storage. First, let's take a look at some of the things drivers do that can wear down a battery. Overcranking the engine can discharge a battery. Many owners only drive their cars to and from the store or in other situations that result in slow average driving speeds for relatively short periods. This type of driving can further discharge a battery that may have already been weakened by overcranking. This is because in stop and go traffic, the charging system is never in operation long enough to fully recharge the battery. This is especially true in the winter, when the battery is cold and electrical accessories such as the front and rear defoggers, headlights and radio are frequently all running using battery voltage all at the same time. Another frequent cause of battery failure is leaving the vehicle's accessories on for extended periods. If, however, you've ruled out customer error and driving habits as the cause of the discharged battery, it's time to focus on the vehicle's electrical system for a possible cause. System faults, such as electrical shorts, slipping fan belts, faulty generator, or faulty voltage regulator, may all lead to a discharged battery. When the battery has been restored to a full state of charge, but a slow cranking problem still exists, check the starting system. Be sure the starter is receiving enough current and that current draw is not excessive. Look for loose connections between the battery and the starter. If your inspection doesn't turn up any mechanical problems and customer driving habits are not at fault, consider how the vehicle is stored. When a car isn't used for extended periods of time, for example, stored in a new car lot, it might very well end up with a discharged battery. The battery can self-discharge through chemical reaction, even with no load attached. Nevertheless, the higher the ambient temperature, the greater the amount of self-discharge. Fortunately, the Delco Freedom battery has a much lower rate of self-discharge than conventional batteries. But in all likelihood, vehicles that are unused for two months, even at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, will not start because of self-discharge. And the natural discharging process is accelerated through another process called parasitic drain. Parasitic drain is a continuous current draw on the battery through parasitic loads, such as small electronic devices, which are continuously draining small amounts of current. Things such as the digital clock and electronic engine controls. 
The most accurate method of measuring for parasitic loads is with an ammeter or multimeter that is able to measure current in milliamps. Just disconnect the negative terminal and connect the meter in series with the battery. To prevent damage to the meter, be sure to start out with the meter set at its highest setting. Then gradually back the setting down until you get a measurable reading. Because of parasitic draw, it's a good idea to disconnect the battery negative cable on any vehicles which are not going to be in service within a 30 to 60 day period. Otherwise, the battery should be recharged every 30 days. Without these precautions, a battery could be inadequately charged when the customer receives the car. Let's create a hypothetical case as an example. It's three days after delivery, the battery is dead, and the customer is mad as a hornet. So we do some investigation into the short history of our customer's new car. Our efforts reveal that it did indeed sit on the lot for a month with the battery cables connected. At delivery time, the battery was dead. So the battery was charged enough to get the car started and delivered. But without a full charge, the battery continued to discharge after delivery. Soon, it was dead again and back at the dealership accompanied by an angry customer. Fortunately, this sort of thing doesn't happen often. But even once is too often as far as your customer is concerned. Then there's more damage done than just a discharged battery. So it's a good policy to keep those new car batteries in mind when you're storing and prepping for delivery. As a matter of fact, many dealers keep a number of new batteries on hand that are completely charged to handle these types of emergencies. It's also a good idea to take care of those discharged batteries that come back for service. Inspect and test them properly. Give them a complete charge and find out what caused the battery to discharge in the first place. Battery condition affects other drivability factors too. If the battery voltage for whatever reason drops below 9.6 volts, the ECM will go into the backup mode and the car will run terribly and the engine stays in the backup mode until the ignition is shut off. It should be apparent from this that a borderline battery can cause an intermittent drivability problem and give you diagnostic fits. Another thing, a weak battery also affects engine idle. Here's how. The ECM senses the low voltage and increases the engine's RPMs. It does this to increase generator output in an effort to provide more charge to the weak battery. And the weak battery can also send false trouble codes to your engine memory. So, although the Freedom battery requires less attention than conventional batteries, its care and maintenance has become more critical with the addition of more electronic systems. The batteries do much more than simply start the car. Oh, one last item. You'll find some rear view mirror tags in your know-how kit. When the battery cables are disconnected, all radio, seat, and clock memories are erased. You can use these tags to let the customer know that the memory accessories need to be reset. Use them. You'll find it a consideration that can go a long way toward building loyal Buick customers.